Dupont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents The Cavalcade of America, starring Cornell Wilde. Good evening. This is Cornell Wilde. I'm returning to Cavalcade to portray one of our country's first great writers, Ralph Waldo Emerson, usually thought of as a cold, austere man of letters. But tonight, we're going to meet Emerson as a young man, a young man in love. This little plot of ground, starring Cornell Wilde as Ralph Waldo Emerson. Time, December 6, 1828. Place, Boston. Mr. Emerson, since we all enjoyed that little sample sermon you preached for us, well, uh, Second Church, you know, is looking for an assistant pastor. Mr. Trumbull, thank you, but I, I don't feel capable of undertaking a pastor just now. Not ill? No, not quite ready in my mind. Not even as assistant? No, I'm afraid not even as assistant. I must say, for a man of God, you come quickly to the point. It was good of you to call, sir. Well, uh, good day, Mr. Emerson. Good day, Miss Emerson. Uh, Mr. Trumbull, my nephew has been under some strain. I dare say, if you approach him again... Good day, Miss Emerson. Won't New Hampshire be cold in December? Well, Boston can get cold, too, you know. Is that intended as a rebuke? I merely said Boston can get cold, Aunt Mary. I heard you. But I saw your eyes double the meaning. Is there something I might eat before I go? There's a pork pie. Tea and scones warming by the fire. I, uh, I was in New Hampshire a year ago this Christmas. I preached for them, and now they want me to visit again, and if I care to, become their regular pastor. Waldo. Yes, Aunt Mary? In all your years at Harvard in your theological training, was there ever any mention of the desirability of a clergyman telling the truth? If I have offended you in, in some way... In the years since your father died, I have been trying, because I was a sister and I felt I owed it, I have been trying to help your mother with her brood, haven't I? Well, that's true. You've been like, like a father to us. And by now, you may have gathered that of all my nephews, you are my favorite. Oh, I know you've been concerned for me, Aunt Mary, done everything. Then you may also know that for my pains, I have never felt more abysmally rewarded. The idea of your running off from this fine opportunity in Boston to fritter away. Oh, really, Aunt Mary, how can you say that when I'm doing exactly what you want? Ralph Waldo Emerson, stop lying. Don't you think that remark rather intemperate? Open your valise. I don't understand you. Do you object to opening it? Well, by no means. Customs inspection? Certainly not. I am most interested in what books you're taking to New Hampshire. Books? Half of them you gave me. Goethe's memoirs, Aristotle on ethics. What else? What's underneath? Oh, Spinoza, the Edinburgh Review. What's this book tucked under your flannel? Oh, that. Huh. Forget me not. Well, from title and tinted binding, this would appear intended for a lady's boudoir. Well, it is indeed something in a lighter vein, yes. Ah. It's inscribed, perhaps to be a gift, uh, to ELT, Christmas sleigh ride in New Hampshire, fondest in memory, dearest in prospect from RWE. Who is ELT? Ellen Louisa Tucker. Her father. One of the elders in the church up Eight. there. Seventeen. Isn't that rather tender? Or aren't you serious? Well, excuse me, it's past time for me to go. On that sleigh ride, will you utter words of matrimony? I intend to speak my mind. You think it likely little Ellen will accept? I think it most likely. What? Hand me that pen. I have a letter to write. Goodbye, Aunt Mary. I, I'm sorry. Waldo, rid yourself of this nonsense in New Hampshire and then come back to Boston. There's something brilliant to be made of your life. We'll make it. I'll be back in three weeks. As you hear those sleigh bells tinkle... Think of yourself in harness, tinkling away your life, hitched to a soft, silly girl. Goodbye. My dear cousin Sam, kindly make inquiries about the person and family of one Ellen Louisa Tucker. 
she is of your neighborhood. Should you uncover any matter that might deter or interdict a possible marriage with Waldo, to whom, as you know, I have devoted good years of my life, and hence am most known. Look at the sun on the snowfield. Everything white and a dazzle. In all New Hampshire, there's nothing but light and oxygen. Come along now. Do you ride out often, Ellen? Every day. Doctor's orders? Uh-huh. Oh. I, I asked him how I might attain a complexion that would draw a gentleman from Boston. He said to ride out. <laughs> he knew, too. He knew. Uh, Waldo. Do you mind if sometimes I giggle? Mm, depends. I I loved your sermon this morning. And your voice. I always do. You're simple and direct. Well, weren't we about to giggle? No matter how far away the pulpit, your voice is so close, it seems like some warm thought stirring inside of me. Tuck the robe in, you'll take a chill. Here, we'd better stop. Whoa, Genevieve, whoa. Look at the hills. The hills are blue gold. Uh-huh. <sighs> the sun in winter has such faith. Faith? Faith that he will, in his good time, thaw out the world. Don't you? Don't I what? Have such faith. In the sun or myself? Yourself. No faith except in my mediocrity. Slugged all my life, in bottom half of my class at Harvard, no one liked me. Tried teaching, failed. In the theological seminary, my eyes went bad, so... That came to nothing. Oh, is this what riding out with me does to you? As my Aunt Mary keeps saying, it's a good thing my father died. He wouldn't have been proud. Oh, you sound bitter. I'm explaining why I have no faith in myself. You will have. I, I might, under one condition. What's that? That I could find someone with such faith that she, as my wife, would endow me with it. Do you know of any such person? There must be many. Well, I thought possibly someone in New Hampshire. I, I would like, of course, if she were, say, about 17 with a taste for poetry and giggling blue gold eyes and with a configuration of faith, body, and soul such that even when I see her from the pulpit, I'm seized with a sickness and a love that locks my speech and I have to cry to God to give me further utterance. Do you know of anyone in New Hampshire? Do you, Ellen? I know of no one in New Hampshire that... Not you? ...that can bring your specifications at every point. Not you, Ellen? Not me. What? Well, at what point is there disparity? You, your faith in me? Oh, by no means. And where? I shall never marry you. And I shall never give you my reason why. Well, that puts a different slant on the sunlight and somewhat dirties up the snow field. Oh, if I've misled you, it has not been in regard to the depth of my affection. No? For they'll beat them as long as I live. But she won't marry me. I... Can't. Nor give a reason. No. Get around there, Genevieve, get around. Get up. Why are we turning? What I understood to be our direction has been reversed. Are you angry? No. But under the circumstances, I think it's perhaps wise to start back home to Boston. Get up. Expect Mr. Trumbull, or are you to go to the church? 
She'll be here at 7, Aunt Mary. Of course, I don't want to influence your decision unduly, but I am certain that your father, were he alive, would urge you to accept this offer to be assistant pastor. But I... I keep having doubts. Oh, Waldo, you promised I me. I know, but... Haven't I been right in every decision I've helped you to make? And aren't you thankful to me that you didn't come back from New Hampshire saddled and bridled for life? Let's not talk about that. Because where would she fit in now? She could never be a pastor's wife, sick little thing. Sick? Sick, and she comes from a sick family. She seemed well informed. Her cousin Fan wrote. Wrote what? Um, they, they die young. Her father, her brother, her brother had to travel abroad for his health and died of a cold in Paris. Her sister Mary died young. What about Ellen? Another sister suffers from consumption. What about Ellen? Ellen. Ellen suffers so from consumption that they give her but a year to live. Now, aren't you thankful to me for keeping you from such a misalliance? Imagine an invalid wife with you. Waldo. Waldo, what's wrong? Waldo, where are you going? To New Hampshire. When Mr. Trumbull calls, tell him I've changed my mind. I'll accept. Waldo. And I'll be prepared to assume my duties in a month when I come back to Boston with my wife. Waldo, if you disobey me and marry that girl... Pray for me, Aunt Mary. I'll pray that you'll suffer and be cursed worse than Job. You are listening to The Cavalcade of America, starring Cornell Wilde, and presented by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. In order that our families may enjoy better living, there are certain jobs around the house that just have to be done. One of them is keeping the kitchen thick and span. Now, any housewife will tell you that is a never-ending job. But fortunately, there is a way to make it a little easier. Just repaint the walls and woodwork with easy-to-use DuPont Duco One Coat Magic Enamel. Because modern chemistry has developed new pigments and new enamel formulas, you can use Duco and know that the white will stay snowy white or the colors will stay bright for years. Duco Enamel, available in a range of beautiful colors, is one of DuPont's better things for better living through chemistry. Ralph Waldo Emerson and Ellen Louisa Tucker were married, and they came to Boston. Two years went by. Emerson became full pastor of the church. Ellen, his helpmate. Always they took great joy in each other. paper somewhere. Such a long sermon for next Sunday that I've... Who's that in the parlor? Oh, it's the doctor. To see me? Mr. Ellison, I waited because I thought I should say a word to uh, the two of you together. Oh? Darling, he's not very happy about me, but he can be wrong. The doctor can always be wrong. I'm quite certain I'm not wrong about this. Mr. Emerson, I should be loath to have Mrs. Emerson spend another winter in New England. Oh, well, suppose we went south for the winter. Of course, soft weather would The West do. Indies or Santa Cruz, Cuba. Ideal. I hesitated to suggest it because I assumed with your many church duties and your pastor's salary... Well, we can work it out, I, I trust. Well, then I'll be going. I'm greatly relieved. Thank you for calling, Doctor. Good night, sir. Thank you. I look forward to your sermon on Sunday... Brilliant sermon. Oh, thank you. Young man, I find that following your mind each week provides me with um, a strenuous but uh, most exhilarating form of exercise. Good night. Good night. Good night, sir. Ellen. No, Waldo. I, I don't think we need any little conscience about me. What the doctor told us, we knew. Now, let's drink some chocolate. It's hot on the hob. Ellen, we could manage the money, couldn't we? Weren't you happy to hear what the doctor thought of your sermon? 
If my sermons are that good, then I must be in an excellent position to ask Mr. Trumbull and his committee for December off. I've crackers and cheese with chives in it. You want me to pick out the hymns for Sunday? Ellen, sweet, stop a minute. Darling, when we married, you promised. Look at me. You promised never to fuss over me. You were never to mention this. Never, never. I know, but this is... You swore on your knees that always you'd look smiling on me as if I were... Mrs. Methuselah outlived her husband a hundred years. Oh, you're angry. Yes, I'm furious. This is our pact. This is our covenant. I'm only 19. I'm a girl. I'm not... I'm... I'm not an invalid. (laughs) Hold my hand. Promise me you'll go to Cuba. <coughs> Let me see Mr. Trumbull. I'll go with you for a month, and then you stay on till spring. Trumbull will advance me the money. I can't let you stay another winter tearing out your lungs. Darling, promise. Promise. Yes, I promise. Oh, thank God. Anything to get out of this wind that blows so blue and shrill. Well, good evening, Mr. Trumbull. Ah, hell's mighty crisp tonight. Fine night. Promise is winter. Nothing like a good bluster in New England winter. Shall I sit here? Yes. Won't you have some hot chocolate? Never touch it. Sherry? Don't use it. Oh, we have some crackers. Cheese with chives in it. Chives give me the rash. Oh. Well, I'd be happy to make you some tea. No. Stomach's in a bad way. Only thing I can do for it is to flood it with buttermilk. Have you any buttermilk? No, I'm sorry, but... All the better. We can come right to the point. Mr. Emerson, we don't like your sermons. Furthermore, a good portion of us don't like your prayers. Excuse me, but is this an official call, or are you Official. Here? I'll start with the prayers. You don't have that fine, resounding quality your father had. You're much too plain. Simple. Like a child. Don't you think the Lord enjoys good, big, flourishing sentences? Mr. Trumbull, you can only pray as it is in his heart to pray. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Emerson. Ellen, you should be resting. Now for the sermon. Very simply, the matter is this. If we pay a preacher good money to preach to us, then it's only fair that he preaches to us the way we like to be preached to. But, Mr. Trumbull... Am I not right, Mrs. Emerson? It's our money. We're buying the sermon. In what respect precisely I have no time to quibble, Mr. Emerson. I'm a busy man. But here's a letter stating in a general way the points on which we differ. Look it over, will you, and let me know. Good night. Mr. Trumbull. Yes? I realize this is a most inept time to ask such a question, but... Proceed. Could I be granted an advance of three months' salary in the month of December free? That is an extraordinary request after what I've just said. I realize that. I tell you what. Let's wait two or three months. See how the sermons go. Then we'll decide. But, well, good night. Chocolate must be cold by now. I'd better go to my study. Where's that letter you left? Waldo. Yes, dear. Bring the letter up. What you have to say, you have to say. I'll read it first. Waldo, if you ever change one word of your heart because of me, I shan't be able to live with you. Darling, be quiet. I love you. And I, you. I'd rather die than harm your life. I'd rather die. Good of you, Doctor, to come out in the dead of night like this. Been the worst winter I've known. No drifting so can't keep a track open. How do you feel? I? All right. Emerson, mind if I speak out? Last few weeks, your sermons haven't been like you. Good enough, but uh, not the way they used to be. Yeah, man, here's your house. Oh. You're driving right past your own house. Whoa. I, um... I won't stay long. Then you might sit with her until morning. Emerson, you know this, don't you? 
He's been dying all week. Yes, I know it. She knows it, too. My dear brethren, it is when a man does not listen to himself but to others that he is depraved and misled. A trust in yourself is the height not of pride but of piety. The good man reveres himself, reveres his conscience. Jesus said, love thyself, God is within. Indeed, the more exclusively idiosyncratic man is, the more infinite. In very deed, the divinity of the individual is the basis of American freedom. For what you can get of moral or intellectual excellence out of this little plot of ground you call yourself, by the sweat of your brow, that is your own portion. And now, if I may speak in a still more personal tone, much as I am grateful to you for your sympathy in my recent sorrow, Still, I say to you that I can only preach or pray or live by abjuring the opinions and customs of all others and adhering strictly to the divine plan a few dim inches of whose outline I faintly discern in my breast. This I have now determined. This I shall do as long as I write or speak or live. Cornell Wilde will return. 
Now is Bill Hamilton, and tonight he has with him three special guests. Two weeks from tonight, 12,000 safety leaders will meet in Chicago for the 37th National Safety Congress. And tonight, we are honored to have with us Mr. Ned H. Dearborn, President of the National Safety Council. Mr. Dearborn. Mr. Hamilton, I'm happy to be here to honor the DuPont Company as one of the most safety-minded organizations in the world. For many years, DuPont has operated on the belief that all personal injuries can be prevented. Now a new world's best no-injury record has been won by the DuPont plant at Martinsville, Virginia. Something like 21 million man-hours with no lost time injury. This breaks a five-year record held by another DuPont plant at Seaford, Delaware. It gives me great pleasure to present to Mr. Don Hartford, manager of the DuPont Martinsville plant, a bronze plaque signifying this achievement. Thank you, Mr. Dearborn. At Martinsville, we have worked hard to win this new world safety record. To keep a plant running year after year without any lost time injuries means that each and every one must think safety and be alert every minute of each working day. It is the men and women of Martinsville who have made this world record. I sincerely appreciate their efforts and cooperation, and I accept this award in their name. It will be placed in the plant as a reminder that injuries can be prevented. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I have another pleasant duty. The DuPont Company won the National Safety Council's Award for Distinguished Service for the war years 1942, 43, and 44. We have again voted awards to DuPont for its accident prevention program in the years 1945 through 1948. I now present a Distinguished Service to Safety pennant for this outstanding seven-year record to Mr. H.L. Miner, manager of the Safety and Fire Protection Division of the DuPont Company. Thank you, Mr. Dearborn. What DuPont men and women have done in winning these awards is inspiring because it shows that all personal injuries can be prevented. If during the period for which the award is given, injuries had occurred in the Martinsville plant at the same rate as in industry as a whole, at least 250 men and women would have been seriously injured. 15 would have been killed or permanently disabled. For more than seven years, Martinsville has had no lost time injuries, a good example of how an effective safety program is preventing thousands of injuries in our plant. Mr. Dearborn, we will send copies of this distinguished service to safety pennant to all our plants as an inspiration to our men and women who are cooperating so diligently and sincerely to make DuPont plants safe. Thank you, Mr. Miner, Mr. Dearborn, and Mr. Hartford for joining our cavalcade for the presentation of the National Safety Council's awards to the Martinsville plant and to the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. one last word to tell you that next week, Cavalcade will bring you one of the loveliest and most exciting stars of the screen, Rosalind Russell. I'll be listening. Hope you all will, too. Thanks. Good night. Tonight's Cavalcade play, This Little Plot of Ground, was written by Halstead Wells. It was based on portions of the book, Ralph Waldo Emerson by Ralph Russ published by Charles Scribner's son. The DuPont Cavalcade of America is directed by John Zoller. The music is composed by Arden Cornwell, conducted by Donald Borey. In the cast with Cornell Wilde were Jean Gillespie as Emily, Ethel Owen as Aunt Mary, House Jameson as Trumbull, and Eric Dressler as the doctor. This is Ted Pearson speaking. Cavalcade of America is broadcast from the stage of the Velasco Theater in New York and comes to you with the best wishes of the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry.
listen to Me and Janie, which follows immediately on NBC.